So the Unix shell is the program that gets started automatically by the login process after you log in and it's under Unix the uh, main interaction tool with which you will interact with the operating system unless you use some graphical user interface that may have other ways of starting uh, GUI applications and the purpose of the shell is to allow the user to interactively start, stop, suspend, resume other programs and also to control which program has access to the terminal at any point in time. There are ways to multiplex where you have multiple programs running simultaneously but only one program for example can receive the keyboard input from the terminal at a time. Um, <clears throat> The shell is also a little programming language. You can uh, automate processes uh, by writing sequences of commands in so-called shell scripts and it provides all the constructs that you would expect from a simple programming languages, loops, conditional branches and so on. Um, it has a lot of support for file selection, efficient file selection uh, via the keyboard. So there is tab completion, but there are also uh, various forms of regular expressions available in order to write patterns that then match uh, a set of files that follow a certain common naming pattern. And it has shortcuts for um, making it easier to enter commands because it keeps a history you can refer to parts of commands that you have added, uh, that you have um, entered before. Because the shell is a normal replaceable Unix program, there have been quite a number of different shells, but the one that essentially has survived is known as the Born shell because it was uh, written in the mid 1970s by Stephen Born, who, by the way, is a graduate of this department. He did the uh, computer science diploma here in Cambridge. And <clears throat> the most commonly used uh, shell today on open source operating system is the GNU replacement called Bash, which is just a pun for it's an acronym for Born Again shell. Um, the POSIX operating, uh, the POSIX standard uh, looked at a number of different shells and uh, went in particular looked at an extension of the Born shell called the Corn shell and that influenced what the POSIX standard specifies are the minimum functions that a POSIX compatible shell has to provide and therefore Bash is also a descendant of the corn shell. Um, MacOS used to ship with the uh, with Bash as well, but then uh, the Apple lawyers became <coughs> concerned about uh, the latest version of the GNU General Public License GPL3, under which uh, newer versions of Bash are licensed. So they never went beyond bash version 4 and in more recent um, macOS version users are encouraged to switch instead to uh, Z shell which is also a popular uh, version of the POSIX shell. So to <clears throat> understand what a shell has to do it's useful to get a bit of an overview of how processes can interact with each other, what inter-process communication mechanisms uh, there are. And if you look into a textbook on inter-process, on, on operating systems in the section of inter-process communication mechanisms, you normally hear about things like sockets and shared memory and semaphores and messages. These are actually later additions to the family of inter-process communication mechanisms that aren't actually uh, supported by the shell. They only exist between application programs that use the relevant 
API calls, but there are many other interprocess communication mechanisms for which the shell does provide an interactive form of accessing them. Namely, we can invoke a process, a process can uh, exit, and when it exits, it can return to the calling process a result value or return value as an integer number. A process can receive command line arguments and environment variables. You can uh, execute a process in a current working directory. Processes can open files and pipes and they have three files opened by default known as standard input, standard output, standard error. You can send a signal to a process. That's a little flag that's set in the processes descriptor table, which either does something to the process like abort it or suspend it, or just tell the process that a certain action is expected of it. So some of these signals can be intercepted by the process. You can, for example, interrupt the process and if the process doesn't intercept the signal, it gets aborted. Um, but it can also um, react to the interrupt signal, for example, to shut down gracefully in some way, release some resource that it uh, has been allocated before it actually shuts down. You can uh, re restrict the resources that a process has uh, access to. So there is an R limit command where you can say a process can use a maximum amount of RAM or CPU time or stack size. There's something called a U mask that influences the default permissions that files have um, that the process creates. You can give the process a priority and the when the process exits you can also query what the execution time of that process was and the shell provides access to all of these mechanisms. I mentioned in particular command line arguments and environment variables and to understand a little bit better what these are it's useful to have a quick look how a uh, C programmer uh, receives these because C was the original system programming language and pretty much every other programming language that runs on Unix uh, provides access to the same inter-process communication mechanisms that originally C programmers had access to. So if a process is called and this is a, a C program, then the C program is invoked by calling its main function and the main function receives as an argument a list of strings. There's an integer variable that says how many uh, arguments there are in this list and there is a, uh, an array of pointers that point to the start of these strings. So if you use a for loop and uh, output the strings that the argv array points to, then you get the command line arguments that have been passed to this program. In addition, there is an externally defined global variable called environ um, that is also a list of strings, but there isn't a variable that says how many there are. Instead, the last of these uh, string pointers is indicated by being a null pointer. So with this loop, you can iterate over the environment environ variable. In this way, you get these environment strings that are also passed very similar to command line arguments to ever, every process. There's a convention, there's a couple of conventions for both the command line arguments and the environment variables. Environment strings uh, have the form name equals value. So name is the so-called name of an environment variable. So these, uh, this list of string is interpreted as a, as a list of assignments. And you obviously can't have an equal sign in the name of an environment variable and they're usually restricted to a 
small subset of the character sets, only uh, letters and, and underscore usually. And then you can assign an arbitrary string to an environment variable just by placing this equal sign separated pair into this environment variable. The first or zeroth uh, argument of the command line argument is usually the name or the path of the program. So if a program wants to find out from where it was started, it can look into arc v of zero and uh, therefore can, for example, determine the directory where this program has been installed. Some programs use this to find relative to ins installation directory uh, some associated data files. And there's the convention that if the main function returns with a value of zero, that signals success, whereas any non-zero value indicates that there is an, that an error has happened. <clears throat> um, I also mentioned the term file descriptor. What, what is a file descriptor? A uh, Unix process can access files in, in three steps. Uh, you first have to open a file and the open call receives a file name, then it locates the file in the file system, and then it creates a file descriptor, a data structure associated with the process in the kernel, and it returns a integer reference to the application with which that data structure can now be referred to. And this is known as the file descriptor. Um, and then each time you read or write, read from or write to the file, you have to pass on that integer file descriptor and the Date, the metadata associated with the file and the file descriptor are deallocated when you close the file. Um, so that is more efficient, for example, than providing the uh, file name each time to every read and write command such that it doesn't have to be uh, resolved uh, frequently. As a convention, the shell opens three file descriptors for each process. File descriptor number zero is also known as standard input and is intended for reading uh, data by a tool that hasn't been told to read from a particular file. There's also standard output where by default many Unix tools write their results and because uh, there may be an error condition and you may want to separate out the error message from uh, the place where normally the default output is uh, sent, the, the regular output is sent. There's a second output file descriptor called standard error also opened and that's meant for error messages or progress messages or anything that's intended for the human user rather than what you may want to feed on to the next program. <clears throat>